Hey, everyone, and welcome to this episode of uh, the Premium Finance Show. And in today, I have Todd Jackson, uh, attorney at law, joining us. And, and I really think, Todd, the, the listeners are going to find this episode helpful for a number of different ways. One, in the unique um, area of law that you practice. But two, um, we get asked or told this statement quite a bit, and I'm sure you hear it too, is it sounds too good to be true. Why haven't I heard about it? How come my guy doesn't know about it? And obviously our, ours pertains to um, the financing structure of life insurance policies, whether it's for estate planning purposes or um, golden handcuff strategies for CFO CEOs for their C-suites. Um, but we're going to dig into that a little bit later. But for the listeners, Todd, if you don't mind, you and I have talked about this a little bit, but why don't you Give us a little bit of, about your background. How, how long have you been an attorney and what made you get into this side of the law? Sure, sure. So I actually have been an attorney for 30 years now. Um, I actually didn't intend to be an attorney. I was in MBA school and was going to go into investment banking. And um, I, I've always loved deals, just doing deals as you know, transactions. And one of my uh, professors in MBA school said, if you really want to do the kind of stuff at the level that you want to do it, uh, you need to be an attorney. And I said, I don't want to be an attorney. They're crazy, right? Well, after lots of discussions, he convinced me. So I ended up doing both. So uh, I did my MBA and, and uh, got my law degree. And he was right. Essentially, every day for the last 30 years, I've used both because everything I do is so intertwined between business and tax and the, and the legal you can't really do one without the other. So um, my my world involves, uh, like I said, transactions. Any Anytime anybody is doing a transaction, that's where I get called in. They're selling real estate, they're selling a business, they're selling, pick up an asset, anything. Yeah. Um, and I get called in generally to discuss um, tax uh, aspects of it, usually deferring taxes, tax mitigation, that type of stuff. So that's what I spend my days doing. When you were studying law um, from a business perspective, did you ever find or think that you'd be specializing on the tax side like you are? I did. Actually, I, it's funny. Um, I, I I took all the tax classes I could in both MBA school and law school. That was always kind of a, an interest of mine and something I was always, always interested in. Now, in some of those classes, I was the only one in the class. Really? <laughs> because nobody wanted to do that stuff so yeah. that's and that was kind of the it's kind of a theme for me um i usually end up doing things that people say i didn't know that was a thing or why would you want to do that nobody's interested in doing that that seems to be what, what i always end up doing yeah me too i, I seem to <laughs> find myself <laughs> in the niche of the niche of the niche in terms of you know when i started and the listeners kind of know this but i started off as a general financial advisor right in 2000. In fact, when I was in school in North Carolina, I did my internship at one of the big wirehouses and realized pretty darn quick that that's not what I wanted to do. And then I got on and started doing full financial planning. And as my career progressed and as my experience started layering on itself, I found myself getting more and more and more specialized. And it's been, you know, it's been interesting to say the least, but, you know, we, we also at Cool Springs are in that, what, why would people do this? How many people are doing this? So on and so forth. So for the listeners, your specialty in law is what? Um, in order of uh, what I spend my time on, tax planning, um, business, M&A, uh, real estate. So all of those really combined because, uh, you know, for, from the transactional nature. So essentially anytime somebody's selling real estate of any kind, selling a business, um, those involve some tax planning. Now, I don't really do many transactions to where somebody's not uh, selling for a, for a big gain because that's where I come in, right? Somebody's, you know, got a, a tax basis and an asset of a million and they're selling it for 10. And they got a nine million dollar game. Yeah, that's when I get the phone call because it's like, uh, I don't want to. I really <laughs> rather not pay that right now. And are you being brought in by other attorneys that know you specialize in this area, or how do your clients come about finding you? All over the place. So attorneys, CPAs, um, uh, real estate, um, uh, real estate brokers, M and A advisors, 
financial advisors uh, is a big part of my business because a lot of times whoever somebody is going to call when they're facing a big tax uh, hit, they're going to call their CPA, their attorney, their financial guy, whatever. And then that conversation goes, hey, I got a guy, right? Let's get on a call and see what we can do to maybe mitigate this for you. How far in advance of the transaction taking place do you need to be brought in to give yourself sufficient time to do what you need to do? So generally, as a general rule, I'd, I'd like to get involved um, as a contract is getting negotiated because uh, I like to get into the contract what we're doing with our structure that will allow us to mitigate the taxes and defer the taxes. So now it doesn't mean I, we can't get it done if it's after that. It just takes a little bit more work. So my preference is if you're to the point where you're negotiating a contract, I want to be on that conversation to make sure we get everything right where we want it. Now, is $9 million, you know, kind of the top line or the, excuse me, the bottom line of the capital gains? Or where would someone say, you know, I need to call Todd? No, so generally, if, if somebody's got a, a capital gain in the 700000 and up is really where the structure uh, makes sense, right? Um, now, I've done them smaller than that, but um, the, the structure is a little bit sophisticated for a two or a $300,000 gain. It's probably not going to be the best benefit. Uh, and obviously, the larger the deal, the more taxes, the more benefit. So I've done them from you know, uh, six, 700,000 to 700 million. So it's just. So, so let's kind of think this through and just use an easy round number of a million dollars of a potential capital gain. So we have a client or you have a client, prospective client that's got basis. And when they sell, they're looking at a million dollar cap gain, right? Yeah. Um, left without using your services, they're looking at the long-term capital gains rate on that million dollar, right? That's right capital gains excess above their basis. Um, when you come in, what are some of the things that you're able to do on average? And what is that? Yeah, so that's yes, what it looks like is, so for example, let's say they're an individual in Tennessee, right? On a million dollar gain, you're looking at 20,000 capital gains federal and 3.8% on Obamacare uh, net investment income tax. So call it 24%. If they're in a state that has state income tax, then of course you go on top of that. And I do a bunch of this in California where we're 37% yeah. on capital gains. So let's just use 20, 25% just as an easy number. So on that million dollars, you've got a tax bill of $250,000, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you can either write a check for that and you've got 750 left to invest uh, or we can uh, use our strategy to defer that and invest going forward the full, the full 1 million. Now, to be clear, this is this is a deferral. What we do is we defer the gains into the future. You know, pick a number, ten years, twenty years, whatever. This is not the Al Capone school of uh, tax evasion, right? It's not that it's not being paid, and that's why it works is because somebody's going to pay it, right? Think about IRAs and four hundred one ks and all these things that are deferrals. This is just one more deferral. So, how far into the future does it get deferred? Well, that's the thing we have. Uh, it's, it's based on installment sale method. We usually, um, we always, we almost always start with a promissory note of a 10 year term okay. because it needs to be to pass the IRS uh, scrutiny has to be commercially reasonable. It's a business loan. You go to the bank and you ask for a business loan for 30 years. They're going to say, we don't do that, right? 10 years, reasonable, perfectly fine. But the seller, right? Um, uh, as that 10 years is coming up, they're the bank now. All right, so they're in charge of terms. They get to say, hey, this is going well. Uh, I'm willing to renew this for another 10 years. Just like every bank can, right? I mean, you might have a HELOC on your house that renews every five years. You might've had that for 30 years. Um, same idea uh, yeah. they get to essentially uh, kick that out as, they get to choose when essentially they want to pay the taxes, whether that's 10 years or 20 or 30. And so at the end of that period of time, after it gets renewed, 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 how does that bill typically get paid? So it's going to be, so the capital gain is locked in when the sale happens. We know what that is, as, as a dollar amount, right? And so the only thing that changes is when that gets triggered. And that gets triggered when you decide to take that money, right? Uh, whether it's all at once or over time, you're only paying taxes as you receive the actual cash payments um, under that installment. So um, 
you you pay that based on whatever the rate is at that point. So I get that question a lot. Oh wow, well, what if what if rates go up, right? Well, my answer to that is always the same. I, if you ask me, would I rather pay twenty four percent in capital gains today or thirty five percent twenty years from now? I'm taking the thirty five percent every time. And why because, is that? Because you're able to then put that money to work and potentially grow it at a faster rate? Two things. I'm able to use that money in the meantime for those 20 years to generate uh, income. And two, I'm paying in future dollars, right? Okay. So I'm getting an automatic time of time value of money yeah. discount. Yeah. Now, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I have figured out one equation. The check that you write to the IRS has a rate of return of exactly zero. I'll double check my numbers on that. It's always zero, right? And so if you look at the rule of 72, uh, how, many, how many years does it take you to double money? So let's yeah. say you, you owe the IRS $250,000 yeah. and it takes me 10 years to double my money. Yeah. Well, what did I do in 10 years? I just used the IRS's money to pay their taxes. Fair enough. Right? Now, does life insurance fit into that at all? I mean, we haven't talked about this before, but I'm wondering if you know someone saved $250,000 in taxes today, if they couldn't take a sliver of that, and then buy a policy to cover those future taxes. Does that happen in your structure? Absolutely. I yeah. just actually just got off a phone call an hour ago on one of my cases to where they are doing exactly that. They're doing premium finance, life insurance. Uh, trust is, uh, you know, is paying for it. Um, and so they're leveraging essentially the IRS's money to create a death benefit and, and income um, for their family. It's, a, it's an awesome fit. We do that all the time inside of these. And do you have to show to the IRS that you did a reasonable calculation or assumption of what that future value is so that they know that money's there or they don't care so long as that bill gets paid whenever the bill comes due? They really don't care so much, but we do that anyway, right? So do you to justify the structure, uh, but that's not, a, that's not a requirement, but it's just part of what we go through to get one of those done. Yeah, so I have two examples um, of clients that you know, I didn't know you existed and, you know, you and I, we met, you know, a couple months ago, but I had one client sell his business last year and he just, you know, he's in uh, Utah and he ended up paying 35% in taxes on the capital yep. gain sale of his business. And it was a huge chunk out of his liquidity of what he was expecting. And then we, I have another client or we have another client right there in Tennessee that uh, is in the music business and sold his catalog for quite a substantial number. And uh, after you and I met, I called him, he's like, dang it, I did it last year. And, you know, kind of our, our, our time expired on when we could go back and kind of fix the problem. But he's like, where yeah. was he a year ago? <laughs> <laughs> and I've done that with another, with a different, with a different artist that uh, found me before and had an $8 million gain, you know, no basis, didn't need the money and certainly would rather invest the full 8 million. Sure. So we ended up getting that done because we were able to do it ahead of the sale. So what are some of the things that when you present this to people um, and you and I, we've kind of talked about this a little bit when they say, sounds too good to be true. Why haven't I heard of this? How come everybody's not doing it? Cause we get that a lot for our cool spring structure. I mean, you have been around some premium finance deals and you have seen kind of under the hood of what we do at cool springs. We do things a little bit different. But how do you overcome that disbelief between clients and their trusted advisors? Yeah, so um, I spend most of my days talking to CPAs and tax attorneys um, about it because the first thing you've got to do is, is make sure everybody understands it. Just because they've never run across it doesn't mean it's not a, a good thing, right? I mean, structure's been used for 25 years. Now, it's, it's not uh, widespread like uh, something like a 1031 exchange or something that everybody knows about, right? Mm -hmm. This is not that. Um, we run this through a, a, a fairly limited network of advisors and attorneys and, um, and trustees for our trust, kind of intentionally keeping it under the radar. You know how it works, right? So when you've got something that gets really big and it gets on the radar, all of a sudden that's a problem. Yeah. Not that it's a problem, but it's just something for Congress and everybody to talk about. Oh, we've got to get rid of this, right? Well, so that's part of the reason we've stayed uh, smaller. I mean, we've done thousands and thousands of these, but um, but not to where it's a household name. And even for people that have you know been attorneys or M and A advisors or whatever for 
uh, for 10 or 20 or 30 years. Extremely common that they have never run across it. it. They've got to run across somebody that's dealt with it before. Well, now they have. And next time somebody asks about it, they can say, hey, I know about that, right? So it's a whole lot of word of mouth as far as how this gets out. Yeah, and that's what we've found, especially with how we structure our financing of our life insurance policies. It's not overly complex, but it's definitely more complex than just paying the premiums with a check, right? And we have found that it's very difficult to put this into any type of marketing piece. There's really no, um, at least not to this point, we haven't thought of a, a leave behind that, you know, would check all the boxes for somebody because there's so many different applications to what we do. It sounds like similar to what you do. And um, we, we've also found that the more we open up our distribution, like you said, you keep it to a limited number of trusted advisors and professionals. In the past, when we've tried to open our, up our distribution to more life insurance agents and financial advisors, they tend to get a little lazy and say things that just aren't true. For example, what we offer is not free life insurance. It's financed and the client may not have to come out of pocket and stroke a check, but it is being paid and it is being financed. And there's a, there's a rate for that. And there's a bill that comes due at some point in the future, whether the lender takes it from the cash value or whether the lender takes it off of the death benefit, their loan is getting paid. It's not free. Right. Yeah. So we run into that a lot. So it's very difficult to, I feel your pain in that regard in sense of it's very difficult to grow the reach and distribution with the quality of advisors that we need. And it sounds like what you need to control the messaging, right? Because like you said, if it, nothing is free in life, right? And in, it's not too good to be true. You just have to understand all the details and ins and outs. And most advisors I've ran into don't have the bandwidth or the desire to learn all of those details and they just try to shortcut everything. Exactly. And just like your, um, um, the, the, the products that you have, um, they only work if they're done the right way, right? And if you pushed it out to the whole world, somebody's going to screw it up and they're not going to follow the rules and we've been able to keep this intact for as long as we have because it's been tightly knit and everybody's trained. It works on these so nobody steps on a landmine and blows the thing up. And do so, you ultimately put your fingerprints and thumbprints on every deal that comes across the table? Or are you intimately involved in all those deals? I do. So, for example, there are um, uh, I'm, a, I'm a trustee for the structure, but there's 20 others across the country uh, that are trustees. Uh, but I handle all the legal work for every one of them. So essentially any deal that gets done by any of them. I'm the one that's creating the structure and working with the sellers and their attorneys and their CPAs. So I'm the one that's kind of shepherding the thing through to make sure it's structured in a way that works. Now, this is any transaction that has a high appreciated value over and above cost basis, right? That's so right. it can be anything, really. It's not the, the type of business doesn't matter. The type of asset I'm, I'm, I'm asking, it, does it really matter as long as it's highly appreciated? Yeah, so there's some limited exceptions, okay? It has to be something that's going to generate a capital gain. So, for example, something that generates ordinary income is not a sale of a, an asset, right? Um, or if it is inventory, right? Again, ordinary income. Okay. Sell inventory is ordinary income. You can't use inventory for this type of structure. But that's there's very limited exceptions. of Virtually everything else that would generate a capital gain, uh, we, can, we can do this with. And it can be... I mean, just to give you an example, I'm doing one right now that somebody has got a contract to purchase a piece of real estate they've been working on for two years. And somebody came along and said, listen, we really, really want that piece of real estate. We'll buy your contract from you for an additional $20 million over and above the $10 million you've got a contract for. They thought about it and said, you know what? We're not going to pass up $20 million in the pocket. So we're going to do this to defer the gain on the $20 million, right? Um, so it, it, it can be just about everything, music portfolios, real estate businesses. Have you done any highly appreciated individual stock positions where it's been inherited and, you know, they're not necessarily, they were told never to sell it, but it's such, such a high value. It's 
you know, it's a decision they have to make, but the thing that's holding them back is the taxes due on that. Yep. yep. And so it depends on the stock. So if it's listed securities, we can still do it. We've got a different structure that we have to do that through, but same idea. Um, uh, if it's private stock in a business, right, and somebody's going to sell their stock, then that's fine. That's 100% good. So um, uh, the answer is yes. I've done lots of those where somebody's just been sitting on portfolio, portfolio for a long time and um, haven't sold because, you know, that's a common concern. People say, well, I'd sell, right? But I don't want to take the tax hit. So I've got, I see people that are passing up a, a price on a business or a piece of real estate or whatever that may be the best price they're ever going to get, ever. But they pass on it because they're worried about the taxes. So what we do is we show them how to have both, right? How to get the best price and still mitigate your taxes. Yeah, because that falls right into your M&A work, right? Yep, happens all the time. I mean, every, I mean, every time I'm talking to somebody about selling a their business, well, I'd sell, and I'm probably ready to sell, but you know, I don't want to end up with some small amount after all the taxes. Very, very common conversation. And so it's perfect lead in for this to say, well, what if you didn't have to worry about the taxes right now? Well, if that was the case, then absolutely. Uh, I'm on board, right? So that daily conversation for me. Yeah, no, that's very interesting. Well, what do you do outside of this? What other businesses do you do outside of this, if any? Yeah, so I'm, uh, in addition to my M&A uh, advisory for selling businesses, uh, obviously do a lot of real estate work for uh, developers and builders, and, um, all of that. I'm also a 1031 qualified intermediary for people doing 1031 exchanges. Because again, tightly connected to what I'm doing in, 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 my, in my practice. And another application of the structure is somebody that is in a 1031 that's going to fail. Either they can't find anything they want to identify because they don't like the prices uh, or they identify something, but then something happens and they can't close on it in the 180 days. We can use this structure to rescue that and still defer the gains. That's huge. I get I, I do these for qualified intermediaries all over the country, even though technically on that front, I'm a competitor. They really hate telling their people, here's your check and here's your tax bill. They'd love to have some way to allow them to not have to do that. And that's where we come in. How does that work? That's very interesting. How does that aspect of it work? So the IRS says, and again, this is, we're not making this up, but we're using what the IRS has already set out in a 1031 exchange. Yeah. If in a 1031 exchange, section 1031 of the code says that in a failed exchange, the relationship between the seller and the qualified intermediary is lender borrower under section 453, which is an installment sale, Okay. which is what we do anyway. Yeah. So all we do is we formalize it into a longer term installment sale because your your 1031 company they're not they're not in the business of servicing notes over a long period they can do it none of them do because they're 45 days 180 days they're out on to the next one um and most of them don't even know <laughs> that what they have is an installment sale because they don't think they need to know right until we have conversations about it and i'm like hey that's that's kind of cool and that gives my folks and out, I feel like, you know, uh, I'm going to be a hero to them because the last thing they want to do is pay tax. They got into this 1031 in the first place to defer their taxes. And now right. I've got to tell them that that's over and here's your, here's your money and here's your tax bill. It gives them an out and, you know, gives them a chance to have a conversation that nobody else is having with their people. So they're an expert all of a sudden. Yeah, it's so interesting. My head is spinning in terms of the types of clients that we come into contact with and prospective clients, most of all of them are business owners of small to privately held businesses. And unless they have, even if they have succession plans down to their, you know, gen two or gen three, their kids or their grandkids, this is still an issue, right? Because they just don't want to give it away. They want value back in return for that. But really outside of the family, um, many of our clients are doing just that, looking for that exit, seeing what that opportunity can be. And like that one client example you gave, I mean, you, you got to take a hard look at that number, whatever your number is, right? I mean, 20 million for somebody might be 200 million for another person. But if someone's offering you that number, what I hear you saying is avoiding the, 
not making the transaction or not selling to just to avoid the taxes, they no longer have to worry about that. Yeah. Yeah. Right? That, that takes that concern off the table because they get to actually have it both ways. Right. Uh, and which really frees it up. For example, I have a lot of uh, buyers in my M&A practice um, that use this with sellers that, are, that have objections to selling. Right. So they have a business that they're wanting to buy. And these are you know, private equities or hedge funds or whatever as buyers. And the seller says, no, I don't want to sell because I, you know, I don't want to pay taxes right now. They say, hey, let's have a conversation. I, you know, we've got a guy that can kind of help you through that to where you can have it both ways. And so even though it's got nothing to do with the buyer, they're, they're, they're nowhere to be seen in this whole thing. They're using a strategy to help convince sellers that it's a good time to sell. No, that's very interesting. Are there any states where this doesn't work or this is federal? So it works federal. federally. Okay. Works everywhere. Yep. What's so one of the more interesting cases you've seen recently? You know, um, had a lot of interesting ones, but I did one uh, in New York and this company, they had about 540 properties across 22 entities that they were selling to a big hedge fund for $128 million. And hmm. we did this structure um, and combined it with um, a 1031 on part of it. And it, so it was, it was a massive, massive uh, undertaking, but got it done, everybody's cool. And they, uh, I think it's the best thing ever. And you have to set these structures up. Ideally, you would set these structures up before the sale takes place. We have to, right? Because How long does that typically take from start? Well, to so it depends on the complexity of the transaction, anywhere from a couple of weeks to a couple of months. It just depends on what it is. There's something called constructive receipt, right? Uh, the IRS says, hey, if, if you're to a certain point and all that's left to do is just send me the money, then it's too late, right? We have to get involved, like I said, when the contract's being written, ideally, to where we're nowhere close to that, um, to where there, there is no money to be sent anywhere because it's still ongoing. That's when we get involved to, to avoid reaching the point to where the, the IRS is, hey, no, it's too late. You're, you know, taxes are due because this is essentially done. So we operate in that space before we get to there. Is there anything that can be done after the fact if someone's listening to this and like, man, I just sold? Is there anything there, that after the fact? Actually are, yes. Yeah. So we've got some different um, uh, possibilities for some investments that can generate. Now, it's got to be in the same tax year, okay? Yeah. But they can generate losses to offset the gain, all right, um, to where that delays the taxes. And then that investment later, call it a year uh, or more, we can then sell that um, investment, generates a gain that is eligible for the structure. So we can actually save a transaction like that if we do it in the same tax year. So if somebody yeah. sold something in January of this year and we can get something in place before December 31st, we can still mitigate that. Yeah, assuming that was their fiscal year, right? Yes. Um, I'm assuming all the big accounting firms, the Deloitte's, the PwC's, the EY's, they understand this and you know understand where this fits in but what about the owner the guy selling that you know their cpa has been their cpa for 30 years and he doesn't quite know this and what's your education curve look like for that person and and how successful are you on a percentage basis of getting them to a point where they feel comfortable with it yeah no uh, very successful because everybody understands what an installment sale is I mean, that's been in the tax code for almost 100 years. Yeah. CPA certainly understand what it is. And so that's where we start. We say, listen, it's just an installment sale. Just because we've got a trust involved, it doesn't really change any of that. So it's really not that hard just because they've never run across it. We start with, I always start with a conversation about something familiar that they get. And then just kind of lead them to how this works. We're like, I never thought about that, right? Uh, but uh, don't ever get anybody that says, no, that doesn't work because if that doesn't work, then then obviously they're going to wipe out 100 years of tax history with the with the tax code because it has worked for 100 years, right? As far as the installment sale goes. But I'm sure you're not batting a thousand, right? But so maybe you are. Um, but when you get that one guy that says, "Yeah, I don't know," this is pushing the edge of aggress aggressiveness, or I just don't see it. Does that happen? Number one and two, it, when it does happen, how do you overcome that? 
Yeah, so it does in, in gen, not often, but it does. And generally the seller takes care of that. And it, it goes something like this. Okay, Mr. CPA, this is supposed to have my back here. Are you paying my tax bill? Well, no, I'm not gonna pay your tax bill. Well, then you might wanna think about trying to get on board here and figuring this out because I'm paying it and I don't want to right now. So, uh, and they've got a long history of making this work. So I don't know how you figured out in 30 seconds that it doesn't work. So you might want to, you know, and that and that those conversations happen. I'm usually not the one saying that, right? Um, but I have had tellers that absolutely say it exactly like that. If you're not paying my tax bill, you need to buckle up and try to figure this out, right? And, yeah. and it's fine that you haven't run across one. Nobody's saying there's anything wrong with that. But here it is in front of you. Ask all the questions you want and, you know, let's get it figured out because it, it's a big deal to me. It may not be to you, CPA. You know, you say, no, we're not doing this. It doesn't work. And then you're on to the next thing in 30 seconds. Well, it doesn't cost him anything to say no. Right. And so most sellers I've got aren't that big of pushovers. And when they're facing a big bill, I had one right here in Franklin uh, earlier in the year, sold their business for $150 million. And they had a tax advisor, we'll call them, that got referred to them out of New York. And we were on a call for two minutes. And he was telling the seller, no, nah, even this doesn't work, whatever. And the seller said, let me, let me make sure I understand this. I've done this for 25 years with no problems. And he figured out in 30 seconds that it doesn't work. And he, uh, uh, and he said, you're fired. Hung off the phone, called me right back and said, listen, I'm going to find somebody else. It's going to take more than 30 seconds to help me with a $40 million tax bill that I'm facing. And he found somebody else and they got it and they asked the right questions. We addressed all of their concerns and we got it closed in June. Yeah, that's that's brilliant. And that, I really I like that for you. You have something that we don't have, which I wish we did, which is, well, who else is going to save you? You know, your guy, your CPA didn't bring up this strategy to save you these X millions of dollars or 25, 35 percent of the sale. What we get is, you know, the financial advisor gets brought in. And they get asked to uh, vet, I'm using that term very loosely, but they get asked to vet our structure. Now, mind you, this financial advisor can sell life insurance, right? And they could have brought them a premium finance structure. Not all premium finance structures work. In fact, we see lots of them that don't work and that have lots of holes in it. And um, these financial advisors say it doesn't work it'll never work the, the arbitrage isn't there the growth of the asset of the cash value of the life insurance will never outpace the cost of borrowing money you know they say they've been a financial advisor for x number of years and they've never seen them work so we had a meeting with the guy in the cool springs home office not too long ago financial advisor comes and sits down and his expert that he brought in um i asked him i said so how many of these have you done how many and we've done over 3,000 transactions as a firm in the last 25 years. And I asked him, how many of these have you done? He's like, well, I've done a few, right? But, but he's the expert, right? And so they get put in this position of being the expert. And so we, I wish we had something that we could throw the hammer down saying, well, we're going to save you 35% of the sale of an asset. We don't, right? Because our whole thing is saving them money out of pocket so they don't have to write those premium checks, That's right. right? So I'm, I'm a little envious that you've got that little hammer to throw down that we don't have but well yeah i mean it, it it does help and it's a huge deal i mean if it's me and i'm selling a something some asset for 10 million dollars and i'm asked would you rather invest 10 million or 7.5 million yeah. well clearly i'm going to not invest 10 million dollars who wouldn't right exactly um and if i've got advisors that are telling me that you know uh to not do it then i want to know why i want to know specifically what the objection is because usually there's not. The objection is usually, well, I've never heard of it. Well, that's that's a two-year-old's answer, right? I mean, give me a real reason why you've got an objection. Research it, ask me questions. And if you ask me a legitimate question, I can't answer it and it affects the structure, then don't do it. That's on me. I that's like not that. how it goes, though. It's just, I've just never heard of it, so it must be a bad thing. Well, that's, like I said, that's a two-year-old's answer. Yeah, it's laziness is what it is, right? And the fact that they're in the same business as you and they didn't bring the idea to their client before you did means it can't be a good idea. Well, so the question goes, how come my guy didn't bring this to me? And the, the answer generally is, well, your guy's an asset manager. He manages assets. If he were a wealth manager, he would have brought this to you. Yeah. Right? 
And that's not as a slam to anybody. It's, it's the truth. The it's just yeah. the facts. It's absolute truth. As we find when we climb the ladder of professional firms and the big four have wealth management component to it. And then, you, you know, you have financial advisory firms that have wealth management. Um, the higher we climb the ladder of professionalism, we see that they absolutely are believers in the structure. Not only what you're talking about, but what we do as well. But the more I'll use Main Street, you know, the guy on the corner, you know, super successful practice, but isn't really in that higher caliber. This is his biggest client, that kind of thing. They don't know, right? Yeah. So it can't be a good idea. Well, so that that's sounds like we both spend our days having the same conversation. It's like Groundhog Day <laughs> over and over again, right? <laughs> they try to frame it differently or it comes from a different angle, but ultimately it's the same question. Sounds too good to be true. Why haven't I heard about it? Why didn't my guy bring it to me? How many people are doing this? How long has it been around? So on and so forth, right? Oh, yeah. yeah, normal stuff. And though my guy in Utah, man, I am, I'm just kicking myself for him because he had a nice, large transaction take place, you know, five digit transaction. And uh, he got hammered on capital gains, both federal and state where he was. And he would love, he would have loved to have those extra couple million dollars that he ended up having to pay. I mean, yeah. kind of kick myself for not meeting you sooner, but it is what it well, is. It is what it is. And that, that does happen. And, and uh, I get a lot, part of an objection sometimes comes from a financial advisor because they want to manage the money, right? And if they don't know the structure, then they'll say, well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll manage the after-tax money and get you in a better spot. And every time I ask, I say, that's awesome. If you can show me a plan to where you can start with seven and a half million or 10 million and invest in exactly the same thing and catch up to the 10 with seven and a half, I really want to see that. Yeah, you can. I'm sure you're going to be shocked that nobody's ever sent me that. Yeah. Right. Because it's not possible. Uh, so that's that's a normal conversation we have. There's so what no other. The, math, there, right? the math is the easy part. The math is yeah. the easy part. And that's what we tell people about what we do all day long. And this is a math problem. Right. It's it's a belief that and remember what we do is we get banks to finance the premiums and they say, well, what happens if the bank stops loaning money? And I said, well what happens if banks stop loaning money across the country and what happens if banks stop loaning money to um hundred percent collateralized assets i mean banks exist to loan money and charge interest and they want collateral right and when they use the cash value of the policies as collateral and then some gap collateral in the early years it's in essence a hundred percent collateralized loan by the bank 365 days a year so if the question is what happens if the bank stops loaning to a cash equivalent asset that they're always collateralized on? The answer I give them is our entire economy would crumble. I well, mean, the bank's out of business because that's the only yeah. purpose that exists. Yeah. It's Especially to do when they have zero risk associated with it, right? I mean, there's one thing where they're loaning money to a commercial real estate property or, you know, it's not fully rented out. You know, they have ways to calculate that risk. These loans that we provide from a banking standpoint is considered to be a tier one loan. It's the safest loan they can give outside of loaning money to another bank. But yeah. yet we still face that disbelief of, well, Every what time. happens if banks stop loaning money? Yeah. Our country crumbles if banks stop loaning money. That's in how we're all created. And even with the rising interest rate environment, banks aren't less willing to loan money. It's just changed the math. It's still a math problem. They're just charging more to bar loan you that same dollar than they were you know, a year ago, right? right. It's still math. It's still All math. So how many of your deals do you find your clients wrapping a bow around it with life insurance? I'm interested to know that answer. Yeah, so um, everybody's different. Everybody's at a different point in their life. Everybody's at a, got a different income need, death benefit need, depending on what their family situation is. So, you know, I probably have... Um, if I were to try to take a guess, maybe 10% of the structures okay. I do, somebody wants to roll some sort of uh, life insurance uh, premium financed into it. So it's, you know, it's a fair amount. It's, yeah, it's I would even a, argue, I would even argue if you and I kind of sat down and talked about it, it could probably be a little bit more, right? Because when you think about it, this loan, this installment sale is creating a liability that needs to be paid in the future. And it's a different number. It's a different risk. 
It's different than their estate taxes. It's different than replacing their income. And so you're creating a whole new liability that by itself can be compartmentalized and siloed and put a life insurance just in place just for that dollar amount. And now I'm sure they're they're doing multiple, you know, needs with the policies that they're buying. But the reality is um, we could justify it to the life insurance carriers that, you know, if the, if the future liability on this is a $10 million number, I'm just making a number up, then we could get a $10 million policy just for that, irrespective of any other insurance that they already have in place. Every time. Yeah. So because there's there's no, at least that I can think of anyway, easier way to generate the liquidity needed to pay the taxes, right? Yeah, yeah. and in exactly, right? And so our clients also say, well, you know, I don't want to tie up my collateral. I don't want to tie up my collateral, which I understand. But in the early years, we need a little bit of extra gap collateral to, to give the policy time to get the engine going to catch up to the loan. We could even use the money that they would have otherwise paid toward the IRS as the collateral, right, to, to bridge that gap. So they're basically using the IRS's money to bridge that gap to then- That's how it- that's exactly how it works in the structure is the IRS essentially is putting up the collateral to make the, the, the policy work. Yeah, the IRS is loaning them the money, for lack of a better terminology. Exactly right. Beautiful. Interest, interest-free it. loan, by the way, from the yeah. IRS. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's beautiful. So it's, it, I mean, once you kind of get your head around that piece of it, it's like, well, yeah, I mean, is there a better way to make that work uh, with that policy? I can't think of one. So how big is your organization? What kind of bandwidth do you have? Because I can envision people hearing this and then this starts to get passed around via text messages. And then these business owners come through us and start coming to you. What's your bandwidth? How many clients can you handle? How big is your organization? That type of thing. I mean, as you have, I've, I've never had that problem in 30 years of doing this. So I don't intend to start having a problem now. We've got, right. I've got a really, really good um, uh, group in we're, we're nimble. So you've been doing it for 30 up. years. How many more years you plan on doing this? Oh, I'm young. I'm only 57. So um, <laughs> I'm not planning on going anywhere anytime soon. Well, and it's like, if it's like our business, people don't retire from our business. They get carried out of our business horizontally. It's all <laughs> between the years, right? Yeah. Luckily, thank God, it's all intellectual, our businesses, right? So, so long as the brain's working, you can keep doing it. That's right. No, do, you have, do you have a succession plan? Do you have that in place? What's that? Look like? Yeah, I've got I've got folks that um, would would step in and and, and take over, and not miss a, not miss a beat. Um, like I said, I'm not ready for that yet, but yeah. All no, but is, when it's our time, it's our time. So if something right. were to happen to you, you know, God forbid, then your clients that you currently have and new clients, the firm would continue moving forward. Absolutely, the they wouldn't. Yep, yeah, uh, they wouldn't miss a beat. Everybody be covered. Wonderful. Yep. Well, what questions did I not ask you that you wanted me to ask? No, I think we covered them. I mean, the main thing is just if somebody, I mean, and I asked the question, how do I know who to send to you, right? And that's always easy. Anytime somebody says, hey, I'm about to sell something and I'm worried about taxes, it's that simple, right? That's the conversation starter. Wonderful. Well, I'm going to be in a meeting all day tomorrow. I'm in Vistage. I don't know if you've heard of Vistage before, but I'm in a Vistage meeting all day tomorrow. And with my CEOs, I'm going to bring this up to them and tell them to reach out and call you. You know, one guy in particular is in the corporate real estate business that I'm thinking of. Another one is a contract attorney that deals with lots of contracts. And I'm going to have him reach out to you as well. Yeah. Which group is that? Um, which Vistage group? Yeah. I'm in the Houston Vistage group. So okay. there's a bunch of them here in Vistage. And I've, in- I've, I'm a regular speaker at the ones here in Nashville. So. Are you really? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So um, I'll find out the groups that you've spoken at. And then, um, heck, man, have you either Zoom or come over to Houston? I could line up some meetings for you and uh, have you speak at one of my future uh, Vistage meetings. Um, I, I was in Houston not long ago. Glad to come and, and talk to the group. Wonderful. Well, next time you're here, if I'm not in Franklin, I'll be here in a couple of weeks in Franklin. But if next time you're in Houston, reach out to me and let's get together. We'll do it. All right, Todd. Thanks for your time, man. Talk to you soon. Appreciate it. Thank you, man. Thank we'll you, see you. Bye-bye.